she knows everything. She just gets her work in with it. You would have left. Well, good evening, Bible Baptist. It is so great to, to have uh, you with us tonight. If you're on Shout 
said amen. Amen. Welcome tonight to Bible Baptist Church Midweek Ministries. We're going to start with prayer and then we'll have you be seated. I'll share a few announcements and updates. But isn't it good to be back in the Lord's house with live music and uh, instruments and singing? And so thank you, Brother Jody and Miss Janet, uh, for that as we get started tonight. And uh, folks are still making their way in. So let's get started with prayer as we begin tonight. Father, it is good to be back in your house after a couple weeks break. We are grateful to be reopening our services again slowly and uh, methodically as we plan out, uh, Lord, for this next Lord's Day. And we ask that uh, you would be honored in all that is said and done. We pray for the message tonight, the, the lesson that will be brought from your word. Uh, Lord, the many prayer requests that we have shared on the pastor's page and uh, throughout the congregation, Lord, we are grateful that as of this moment, uh, we have no one in the hospital to report, and we are thankful for the uh, good news of uh, progress being made in those that have been ill and, and uh, uh, different uh, illnesses and sicknesses. Lord, we also do pray for the Maddox family and the passing of Dino's mother. We ask for your uh, care and compassion, Lord, upon them in this time of grief and time of loss. We pray for our nation. Uh, which continues to struggle with uh, uncertainties and, and uh, Lord, division. We pray that you would, um, uh, Lord, give solutions and there would be a um, healing process begun in so many different ways in our nation's needs. And, Lord, today we thank you for our veterans. We thank you for the fact that because of those men and women uh, who have served and are serving, that we have the freedoms to assemble, the freedom to meet here tonight. And, uh, Lord, all that our veterans mean to us uh, across this land and we thank you for their, their service. Uh, Lord, we pray that you'd be again honored in all that is said and done. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Thank you and be seated. And to any of you who were veterans, uh, we appreciate your service and thank you so very much for all that you've done. It fell on a funny time this, this week uh, in between Sundays like this. And so uh, we certainly want to recognize and honor those men and women who have worn our nation's Uniform. Those watching online as well, thank you to all our veterans. And so uh, we're beginning this new phase, this reopening from our reopening, so to speak. And uh, we've been out for a couple of weeks, and we wanted to ease back into it by opening our doors this evening, getting us ready for this coming Sunday, the Lord's Day. So let me give you just a couple announcements about Sunday. Uh, and then our lesson tonight, our Bible study, will be by Pastor Michael Finley. He's going to uh, bring us uh, the, the life group lesson that would have been Sunday if we had been in our life groups. And so we won't get behind on that. And uh, he's brought that into a, a teaching message tonight for us. But this Sunday, as we come back to the campus of Bible Baptist Church Savannah, we will have the same schedule of our 8 o'clock early service. Uh, we will also have our 915 life groups. But all of our Victory Hall life groups, with the exception of the college class, are going to be meeting here in the auditorium as we did earlier this fall when we all kind of met together uh, in those groups. Those five or six classes will be combining in this large auditorium. So uh, that will be a change. We'll be back to that schedule. And then at 1030, we also will have our second uh, worship service of the morning. And again, remember in any services, masks are encouraged and certainly you're welcome to wear the masks and uh, we have hand sanitizer and masks available at the welcome centers and the common areas around the building. But one new thing we're going to add is that during the eight o'clock service and the 1030 service, uh, there will be a room available for anyone who just wants to be in a mask only environment. And so if folks uh, are only comfortable around others wearing masks, then room 102 in Victory Hall right behind us, it's the largest room on that floor, uh, it will be open for folks to wear masks only, and there's going to be a video, a live video feed of the service from in here in there. So there'll be a staff pastor in there to greet you and welcome you and have prayer, and then you'll watch the service online in there. And uh, if that grows and we, we feel the need to move that, we always can move that to the social hall in the future where there's much more room if necessary. So that's a new thing we're adding this Sunday uh, just to kind of, again, limit our small group contacts and to uh, provide that option for those who would only be in a mask service uh, until we can get through this, this wave that's going through in our, it's not just our area, it's all across the country. Actually, uh, the Southeast is doing pretty well compared to some other parts of the country. So let's be sure to pray for folks around the world and the, the nation as, uh, as COVID continues on. I know there's a lot of plans with Thanksgiving and Christmas and all these things coming up. So we just really want to pray uh, for safety and for health of people who've been affected. 
uh, by this. So I'm glad to be back with you tonight. I'm looking forward to preaching in person. Again, it's hard. I told Michael, we may have a small crowd, but it's still better than preaching to an empty room. Amen. And uh, so make sure that uh, uh, you are, are uh, uh, encouraging. And uh, I told him, preach like there's a thousand people. Amen. And uh, you just, so you got to make up for that. Okay. Every one of you has got to be uh, right on it. Bobby, are you on it? Amen. All right. See, Michael, I'm getting warmed up for you. They're ready to go. So, uh, Brother Michael Finley, you come right ahead and bring our lesson uh, for this Wednesday night service. Well, welcome to those that are here and also online. Am I on? Okay. Well, uh, it's good to be here. And like Pastor said, it's good to have people uh, in service. And it's good to see the children over there and, and be able to have some service over there. And then also to those that are watching online that... Uh, maybe this is an opportunity, they may be out of town for work, they may not have the opportunity to be here tonight, but they are watching with us online. And so, uh, like he said, we are looking at our Sunday school curriculum. It's not my Sunday school curriculum, uh, because I have the benefit of teaching about uh, the young marrieds, and we're talking about marriage uh, and everything that, that, and it usually just turns into a giant argument between husband and wife, but uh, we have fun in there. Um, so we're going to be, uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 6 is where we're going to be. Matthew chapter 6. Now, I, I do have to say the same topic uh, was taught uh, by a well-known person this Sunday morning. And, um, and so I hope that you'll be able to follow along. Our pastor taught uh, right along with this, but uh, we're going to go through this. But what I have for you, if you're watching at home, all right, if you're watching at home, um, I know there's thousands of people that are watching right now. I need you to do me a favor, all right? And if you're in here, you can do the same thing. I need you to get a piece of paper and a pen, piece of paper and a pen, and I will explain why later, okay? And uh, I was going to have a whiteboard up here, and I was going to call somebody up um, to, to play a game with me. Um, not all the youth pastors out of me yet, um, but I couldn't get the whiteboard up here. So um, what I want you to do is picture this. I want you to picture uh, you're at your house, and you have whatever hand you write with, you have a pen in, and you have a tennis ball in the other and what I want you to do is you have to constantly throw the, the tennis ball up in the air and catch it and write your full name. How many of you think you could do that very well? Right? Probably not, right? Um, it would be pretty hard, right? It's hard to juggle those things. Now, all right, here's, here's what I need you to do, all right? So if you're watching at home, get your piece of paper and get ready. So what I want you to do is I want you to write two things. Two things that you do well. They don't have to be, they don't have to make any sense, right? But th two things that you do well, all right? And so, for example, let me tell you, all right? And I'll, my wife said, um, organization and tennis, okay? Really random. Uh, I asked my good buddy, Kent McInerney, he said, art and board games, specifically strategy games, um, I also had Autumn Serto, and she said baking and math. All right, so what I want you to do is go ahead. I'm going to give you a few seconds. You have to play the game. You have to play the part. Write two things that you do well, all right? Two things you do well. Now, Bonnie Maxey, don't comment what you do well. Just write it down what you do well, all right? Don't comment what you do well. Write it down on a piece of paper, okay? All right. Now, once you have those, we're like a, it's like a test. Look back up here. Eyes on me, all right? But how many of you can say you can do those two things at the exact same time very well? That's, that's impressive. I'm going to ask Wendy Maxie, I'm going to ask you what your two things are and see if that's true. Now, I personally can't see my wife organizing the closet and playing tennis at the same time. That probably wouldn't go well. Um, Maybe Kenton drawing with one hand his artwork and moving uh, board game pieces with the other, that would be pretty hard. Or uh, Autumn uh, mixing up a cake and doing uh, all this financial math work would be a little difficult, all right? Uh, but oftentimes, what, when we're thinking of something, whatever we're doing in that very moment uh, kind of competes for our attention. And so if you think about doing those two things, one of those is competing more for your attention, and so that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. And as Christians, we often try to, to juggle these things, but it's hard to do that. It's, it would be very hard 
to juggle a tennis ball with one hand and write your name where it actually looked legible, right? Um, I don't think I could do it. I, I wouldn't even try it for you guys because it would be a mess. But oftentimes we try to juggle uh, spiritual things and worldly things. And we think it's, it's easy, like I, I can do it. And we're going to explain that in a little bit. We try juggling spiritual responsibilities all while trying to gather and gain wealth and possessions. And uh, I go back to my high school days and I remember uh, playing baseball in high school. And I remember hearing a coach uh, say this one time that, uh, you can only play one certain position well at a time. You can't play first base and third base at the exact same time and do them both well. You would run back and forth and you'd look like a wild man. So he'd always focus, or tell us to focus on one position at a time. Whatever your position you're playing, do that well. All right. So if you now have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 6, if you'll stand with me as we read God's Word, we're going to start in verse 19. Um, and we're going to go down through the, the, that chapter. It says this, uh, verse 19 says, Lay not up yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor dust uh, doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thou whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil... Thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for uh, for for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. Verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye, much, are ye not much better than they? Which of you, be t- uh, by taking uh, thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought of for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and, morrow, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall, be, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye little of faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But ye seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take the thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You may be seated. And so as I read that, and we talk about, uh, and you've heard this many times, and like I said, pastor spoke on this, and we cannot serve two masters. And we're going to look at that tonight, the importance of, Uh, Number one, if you're taking notes, the importance of loving one master. The importance of loving one master. And we see that. um, Have you ever had to try to have a conversation? And these are the kind of things that I would get in my class, I would get in trouble. Have you ever had to try to have a conversation with your spouse while they're doing something? They may be reading a book or looking at their phone, and you're trying to have a serious conversation, yet you don't really feel like they're fully listening. Or maybe if you have a teenager or a child, and they're focused on something else, and you're trying to talk to them about something serious, right? What happens is their attention's not fully with you. And um, Rachel's so bad about this. She looks at her phone all the time while I'm trying to have serious conversations with her. No, that's not true. That's me. But those, those people, your, your, your conversation is directed at them, but their attention is not directed at you. And so it's hard for them to have a conversation. And, and some people can do these things okay. They can be doing one thing and having a conversation. Uh, I'm not one of those. I have to be fully focused on Rachel or whoever I'm talking to. If I'm going to get what you're saying, I'm, I'm directed at you. If I'm not, realize that I probably heard about half of what you said. But... Some people can do it well, other people can't. And so in this passage that we just, uh, in that very first passage, uh, we see the importance of a single-hearted goal to serve one master. And so we're going to look at this, um, the alternative. 
And so Jesus did not want his followers to simply live for material benefits, to live for the blessings and having riches and possessions. And so as I was reading, and the Jewish people were probably a little confused because early on in Deuteronomy, God promised to bless them materially if they obeyed him, if they followed him. And so they're thinking, well, we want these material blessings. And so many Jews thought that simply uh, having these material possessions were a mark of God's special favor. If they were, had riches and they had money and they had uh, these, this wealth, they thought that oh, God's uh, favor is on me. And they would look at Abraham and David and uh, many others in the Bible that pleased God and they were rich and they had uh, all these different things, animals and houses and everything. And they, they saw that and they wanted that. Unfortunately, the Jews forgot that material blessings, they come from God. And so they, would, they believed if they could attain wealth at any means possible. And you see a lot of people like that today. If I can gain wealth or possessions by any means possible. And you see this happen in families where the, the husband may think, I, I just want a little more money. I want the bigger house. I want a nicer truck. I want a bigger boat. I want my wife to have all the jewelry she wants. And what does he do? He sacrifices so much to have that. And what happens is they would do that at any means possible to gain these worldly possessions. They would use their skills. They would have these jobs. And they would sometimes go do it with uh, illegitimate means to gain this wealth. And they would consider themselves blessed. They would say, well, I'm spiritually blessed because I have all these things. And so they looked at that they had God's favor. And so Jesus himself warned against this type of reasoning. And so I ask you this question. How many of you have, uh, maybe you have one right now, you have a craving. How many of you have eaten dinner yet? How many have not? How many aren't going to eat dinner tonight? Okay. Um, right, but we get different type of cravings. And you think of a craving, you think of a food. Um, and I asked Rachel today when I was uh, kind of looking at this, and I said, what's one of my cravings? And I had already written it down. And I want to see how much she knew me. And she said, something sweet. And I said, you got it. Anything sweet. Brownies, chocolate chip cookies, chocolate cake. I'll go for it, right? Um, it's, the, it's the worst of all things right now. We have a massive, massive tub of candy in our house. And everything is uh, my wife, organization, okay? She has Ziploc bags of all the different types of things. So she has like... Um, chocolates are in one bin, and then we have like the Swedish fish and like the Twizzlers in one bag, and then we have the Sour Patch Kids and the Skittles, right? All the things that we keep away from Lola because she'll turn into a maniac if we let her have anything. But I usually go at nighttime and I walk in and I'm like, hmm. And usually by the end of the night, by the time I even get close to going to bed, there's like five or six candy packages in the trash can for my uh, indulgence that I just went after it. But uh, what, what kind of things that you may crave for? There's something back home. I'm from Oklahoma, and if you've ever been out there, there's one restaurant that we don't have here, that we didn't have in Ohio, that we've had nowhere else that I've ever been to, but it's called Taco Bueno. Oh, think of Taco Bell, but so much better. The food's greasier. Oh, Taco Bueno. And I think about that. Moment of silence. Mm. If anyone's watching in Oklahoma, you can send me uh, a Mexi, Mexi dip and chips. You can send me a Bueno Chilada. Any of that. Mom, come on. Um, that, that's the first thing. If I ever go to Oklahoma, that's, that's one day. We go, to the, we go to Taco Bueno. I'm telling you, if you ate there, you'd be like, what? You like this place? Anyway, moving on. Didn't mean to, I'm, I'm watering in my mouth right now. Um, we also many times have those cravings for material things. And, and uh, I don't know about you, but I have a craving sometimes for material things. Uh, mostly for me, it's electronics or tools. Um, I have a craving for tools because I love woodworking. And so I have table saws and saws and things that I don't need, I have. And if you probably need some type of woodworking equipment, I probably have it. And uh, I love tools, and Rachel always sees me, and I'm like in the closet, like looking on my phone, and I'm like, oh, tools. And she's like, you're not getting any more tools. There's, you have way too many. 
But you may have some type of craving for a material thing. And you may think, uh, I, I really want that, but it's just too expensive, right? And, and maybe you've been in this situation before. I really want that, but it's just too expensive, but you decide to go ahead and buy it. And you enjoy it for about 37 seconds, and then you go, oh, why did I buy that? Why did I? I do it, everything I buy. That's what I do. I'm like, Rachel, are we sure we need this? Or did we really need this? But really, as I thought about that today, is those things that we, we want materially, how long does that craving stay fulfilled? You buy a new TV. You want a big TV, right? And so you buy a new TV. How long does that craving stay fulfilled until you bought a 70 inch now you want an 85 inch right or you may have someone that these people that they wait all night in line to get a new apple iphone and they come out with 11 and they get the first one in a year in a year they're coming out with a 12 right now and they're doing the same thing it doesn't stay long they always want the next best thing but i have a question for you and so you think about that craving how long does that stay fulfilled but what about your craving spiritually to share the gospel how, how do you feel with that? Is it always fulfilled or are you lacking in that craving? Do you, do you have a, a craving to see people come to know the Lord? Do you have a craving to, to see people come to church and be discipled and be baptized and families to be restored? These are, these are the type of cravings that we should never lose. And oftentimes when we try to serve the world and serve God, those cravings die out. And so we know that earthly possessions don't last. And you see that in, in verse 19 there. It says that we lay up ourselves uh, treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt. And so if you think about this, you can drive around any city, uh, any place, and you can see at one point probably houses that were magnificent. They were beautiful, well-kept. And now maybe they were built in the 50s or the 30s. And I was looking at some houses today, some before and afters, and I should have had some, but um, some magnificent houses. But those same beautiful, amazing houses, if not taken care of, they deteriorate and they fall apart. And eventually they have to be completely condemned and t torn down. The most expensive clothes eventually wear out. And so all these things that we want, that we crave, eventually will, will rust or they'll They'll, they'll corrupt. And also, thieves break through and steal because they want to gain that possession. They want to gain that wealth with really having no work into it. And so they want it, they want it for them. And so nothing we have in our garage or in our driveway or in our closet or in our, on our desk matters. Nothing, no computer, no car, no boat, no golf club matters in the end. And so we place so much importance on the value of things, of how, how much can I get, right? Many of you probably live this lifestyle. How much can I get for the cheapest amount, right? My wife, love her to death. I'm so thankful for her. She often like gets ready on Sundays. I can't believe I'm about to say this because she's probably going to kill me. But she's like, do you know how much this outfit costs? $7. And I'm like, girl, keep it up. I love it. Right? She's like, nobody would know, but now you know. So don't share that with anybody else. But oftentimes, we, we put so much value into what we have. If it may be the car we drive or the boat that we have on the water or the house that we live in or the cabin we go to. And so Jesus encourages his followers to lay up riches in heaven where there is no decay, there is no rust, there is no thieves, and God is able to, to preserve our treasures there in heaven. And so Jesus reminds his listeners that they will live their, they will live their uh, life uh, in the light of the treasure they are seeking. And so if you think about that, the, the things that you're going after Right? If you're going after earthly treasures, that's where your time, that's where your life, your energy, your effort is focused. Right? On how much money can I get so I can buy this? Your earthly possessions. 
And we're, we, many, we many times sacrifice a lot of things to gain those earthly possessions. But if you're going after heavenly treasures, our life, our energy, our effort are focused on the Lord. And you can easily tell when someone what they're into by having a conversation with them for maybe a short amount of time uh, or kind of watching what they do. You can see what they're into. Um, if you n- talk to a sports enthusiast, you often f- soon find out that they know way too much about sports and they're willing to tell you. If you talk to Jody Wooten, he can tell you anything about anything. Tires, cars, cameras, phones, computers, everything. Literally, just go have a conversation with him and he knows something about it. He's looking at me right now. That's a truth, true statement. But you may know somebody like that, that you can tell what they're into by what they talk about. My wife, I love her to death, and normally she sits there when I'm talking about something that she could care less about and shakes her head and says, oh, that's nice. And then after, I'm like, do you really think so? She's like, no, I was just, I was just helping you like, just get it out. Thanks, honey. Appreciate it. But you may know somebody like that, or you may go to McDonald's every morning and you may see the group of old men that are sitting, drinking their coffee. And you walk by and you hear their conversation every day. What's it about? The weather. Because they don't have anything else to talk about. What's the weather like today? Eh, it's raining. In Savannah, at least, it's been raining constantly. But you often can know what someone is into by simply having a conversation. So we can either serve God or serve ourselves. If you're taking notes, you can look at 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, with the, uh, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And so we see this, that we can serve God with all of our hearts and devote our lives to him and not depend on possessions or we can take the alternative and serve ourselves. The next thing in that is this, the conditions. And if you look at verse 22, it says, the light of the body is the eye. Now Jesus used the eye here and I'm no science teacher or um, amazing Right There's other people in this room right now that could probably explain to me everything about the eyeball. Right, I remember when I was in school, I carved open an eyeball from like a pig or something. I don't even remember how it worked. I just remember it was gross and it smelled. But the, the eye receives light and then it bounces around the whole things and then in your brain there's a picture. I don't know how it works. You might, I don't, you can Google it later. But it's a, it's a light receptor, light receptor, and he uses this to symbolize the heart function as a receptor of spiritual understanding and blessing. And so, if the heart is troubled with earthly matters, meaning you're trying to gain riches and gain possessions, and constantly living and serving yourself, it cannot receive spiritual light. It's kind of clouded or or dark. It's, uh, it's like trying to, it's like opening and closing your eyes, right? When you open your eyes, you see light. When you close your eyes, you see darkness. And so those that think they can serve God and also continue to serve the world and gain possessions have deceived themselves. Uh, they think that they can open their eyes and close their eyes at the same time. It's not possible. Right? You either have to open your eyes or close your eyes. And so they're trying to do both. They have the thought that they, they receive light. You cannot receive light through a darkened heart. And when we are wholeheartedly pursuing after worldly things and worldly possessions, right? That's, all, that's pushing out all the spiritual light and we can't see it because we're trying to serve ourselves. And so I think of the story or, or I think of... If you take away, uh, if you have someone and they have so many possessions and they have so many uh, amazing things and in one minute all of that is taken away, what happens to their their spirit? What happens to their countenance, right? Many times it's they are down and out. 
Many times you may know someone, you may know a believer that is um, completely, uh, love, they love the Lord and they serve the Lord and they're gener- generous to the Lord. And at any given moment, if anything was taken away, it wouldn't change the way that they look at life in any way, shape, or form. But you have other people that are completely focused on possessions. And if you t- take that away, they would lose all hope. They would lose faith. Um, how many of you, maybe online or in here, you like to camp, right? Um, we and my family, my wonderful wife, does not. Um, her idea of camping is a camper, or what we call glamping, glamorous camping. Um, but me and Lola, we camp out in the backyard one day, and she loved it. Uh, I, Lola even took a shower in the backyard, probably too much information, but it was great. We cooked on the fire. We slept in the tent. I couldn't believe she made it, but she did it. But if you're out in the woods and it's pitch black, right, and your eyes, and there's no moon, it's cloudy, and it's dark. Uh, I remember when I was growing up, when I was in college, uh, we did this thing called spelunking. We went caving. I don't know why I did it, but we went spelunking with some friends in college. And you'd have headlamps on, and you'd be walking through this cave, and then everybody would turn their headlamps off, and you literally could see nothing. It was so dark. And so I'm thinking of that as I'm writing this down, and it's dark in the woods, or it may be dark in your house. In your house, it might be a little bit easier unless you have a little kid, and they have Barbies or they have Legos, and then it's in an ultimate nightmare to try to, try to walk through and not step on one of those mines like a Lego. Those are the worst. But if you're in the woods and it's dark and you can't see anything, or you're in a cave, right, it would be probably the last thing on your list to take off running. Because you would have no clue where you're going. I have a side story that really may or may not have to do anything with this, but you might get a laugh out of this. If my parents are watching, they will. One time I was in, uh, well, I said one time I was in fifth grade. I was only in fifth grade one time. Um, Don't think it was more than that. But I have worn glasses most of my life, and uh, my my whole family wears glasses. um, And so in fifth grade, we were doing, I was the top dog, you know, fifth grade in elementary school. Man, you're the big guy on campus. And I remember in PE class, Mrs. Note in Patrick Henry Elementary, Tulsa, Oklahoma, we were doing gymnastics. And so the gym was full of all kinds of gymnastics equipment, the parallel bars and the beam and the uneven bars and uh, the lower balance beam and the vault and all that stuff. And it was scattered all over the gym. And it was like an entire section of our PE class. And I remember we used to come into our gym and there was a stage at the back and we'd set all of our stuff, jackets or books or anything that we had. And that's where my glasses went because I was not allowed to do gymnastics without glasses. Now the problem, if you have glasses, you literally, everything looks like a blur. So I don't know how that was successful for me, uh, but I'm I'm about to explain why it was not successful. So we were going through class, and we had made our way up to the front, and we did whatever we had to do, and the bell rang. And you do what any other fifth grader would do. You run as fast as you can to get your stuff. So Michael Finley, fifth grade, no glasses on, runs as fast as I can. Everything is blurry. I think I am good to go until my face meets the balance beam. And I was running full speed. First thing I know, I'm running like a gazelle through the gym. Next thing I know, I'm laid out flat on the mat. And my head is ringing and my eyes are like, bloop, bloop, bloop. I told you all that to say for some reason. But, um, but I, I was thinking of, of navigating. And when we don't have clear sight of something, right, when it's dark or it's cloudy, and you don't have a clear sight of something, we have to sometimes take our time. It's hard to focus And so in life, when we are so focused on worldly things and worldly possessions, right, we're not not allowing ourselves to see the spiritual blessings. The next thing is this, the results. And if you look in verse 24, it says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And Jesus applied what he had taught He says, simply, we cannot serve two masters. We cannot serve two masters at a time. We cannot serve God wholeheartedly, and we cannot serve 
the world wholeheartedly. We have to make a choice. We have to choose. A master is someone who exercises power over someone else. And so what I want you to do is now on that same piece of paper, if you flip it over, all right, here's another activity for you. All right, what I want you to do is right in the middle, I want you to draw a line. All right, online, you're going to see a line on your screen. All right, you're going to see a line on your screen. That's, if you're in here, that's what I want it to look like. All right, a line on the screen or a line on your paper. Or if you're watching online, you can, you can do this and look on your screen. All right, what I want you to do is I want you to take whatever finger you want, your, your right hand, left hand, and take your pointer finger, and I want you to place it on the left-hand side of that line and just right on the line. Okay, right on the line. Everybody, everybody play. If you're online, okay, if you're watching, do it to your computer screen. Get up from your couch and do it on your TV. Put your coffee down, whatever you have to do, and get up and play the game. All right, so put it on the left side, and what I want you to do is you can do it as fast or as slow as you want. I want you to follow that line all the way to the right side. Easy enough, all right? Some of you did it really slow, thinking that there was a trick to it. There's not, all right? Now I want you to take it from the right side and go back to the left. All right, now pick up your finger, put it right in the middle. Now I want you to go left and right at the exact same time. Ready, set, go. You can't, right? You can't do it, all right? Okay, you can take your finger off your paper now. Right, I, the reason I want to show you that was you can't do two things simultaneously. You can't serve two masters. You can't go right and you can't go left at the exact same time with one finger. And so Jesus used definite words to describe one loyalty to his master. And we think of these words as maybe strong words. He used the word love and hate. He used the word hold and despise. And you may think, well, those are a little um, aggressive. Those are, those are a little um, tough words. And so when Jesus is using love and hate, it's not an emotional feeling. It's a choice. And if you're taking notes in Malachi 1, 2, verse three, uh, 2 and verse 3, it says, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not, thou, was not Esau Jacob's brother? saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. And when you read that, you see he loved Jacob, but he hates Esau. The idea of God loving Jacob was God's choice of Jacob. God's hating Esau was his choice relating to he was, he was not choosing Esau. And so it's a simple decision. And people will either serve God or they will serve themselves. We cannot do both. And so Jesus wants to make it very clear that no one, no one can be loyal to two masters. Money in itself is not evil. And I, in fact, um, I know a lot of people that are very, very wealthy. Uh, my dad, he knows a lot of people in, in their church that are very, very wealthy, and they are the most generous people um, ever. And so Money in itself is not evil, but it's uh, oftentimes what we do with it that kind of makes it evil and where we spend it and where we spend our time. And so we need to remember the importance that we can only love one master. Number two. Number two is the implications of loving one master. Um, when a person is deciding who to serve, they often will ask, Right When you're thinking of, of this, um, who will take care of me? Where will I find protection? Where will uh, I find care? Um, if I choose God, if I choose to serve God, what will happen to me? And he answers this question uh, throughout the rest of this chapter here. And the first thing we look at is uh, God cares for his own. God cares for his own. And so knowing what his audience was thinking... Jesus commanded them not to be anxious, not to worry. Life involves far more than physical provisions like food and clothing. And Jesus illustrated how God provides food uh, by noting his provisions for birds. Look at uh, verse 26. It says, Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, 
neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. He says, look at these birds. I take care of them. I feed them. And then that last, the last part of that verse there in 26, are ye not much better than they? Are ye not much better than they? And so we see here that he's illustrating that these birds are important to God. They're a part of his creation. And so he says, aren't you much more important than they are? And so they were known as the, they were the least expensive sacrifice to buy, but God cares for them. Now, uh, many of you are probably like me and uh, you worry. How many of you worry? I worry, oh my goodness, my wife hates it. I worry about everything, right? Um, but I worry about the sim- little simple things, but I worry and I get anxious sometimes. Um, but oftentimes we, we get worried and it may be, it comes out to be nothing and we feel better about it, but then oftentimes we get anxious or worry about something else. But I often think to myself, I, I remember somebody asking me this one time, what do you gain by worrying? Heartache, hurt stomach, loss of appetite, right? I don't gain anything positive, right? I'm often off, I'm off worse. And I often have to go to this, 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Casting all your cares upon him. Uh, my sister uh, sang a song back in the day, Casting All My Cares. It was an old song. She sang it at camp one year. Listen, if I can find the video, this church will see it sometime. She would probably absolutely, never mind, we won't go there. It would be bad. Jesus illustrates in verse 28, if you look there, and he says, And why take ye thought for raiment? Why, why are you, your clothing... Why are you worried about your clothing? Solomon had great wealth, yet he was not the best dressed. Now, this is something that I struggled with in school. Um, I wanted to be fashionable, and I wanted to look good. And I often made, gave my mom such a headache because of what I wanted to wear, and I wanted to look cool because the teens, I've told this story, I wanted a pair of white, all-white Nike shocks. How many of you remember Nike shocks? Whoa. Okay, all white Nike shocks. And I wanted them so bad, and my mom went and took me and bought them, and they were really expensive, and I was sporting them for like two days, and then they got dirty. And then it was bad. I'm not like Caden McInerney with like perfect shoes. He's had them for like three years, and they still look like they're out of the box. And he'll, you can drive him nuts if you take all the shoelaces out and throw them in a pile. It's great fun. I've done it once, and I live to tell about it. But if God provides uh, for these lilies, in verse 28, it says, And take ye thought for the raiment, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. He says, I care for these lilies, but yet you're worried about what you're going to wear. You're worried about where your clothes are going to come from. And so Jesus' argument was directed to his listeners and to bring their attention to ways that nature teaches God's care and provision. Looking at the birds and looking at the lilies, that he takes care of those things. And then if you go over to verse 30, he says, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which to, uh, today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more like clothe ye, O ye of little faith? And oftentimes when we worry about something, right, oftentimes when I'm worrying about something or anxious about something is because I'm not faithful to the Lord. I'm not putting all my faith. I'm trying to take care of it of myself, my own power, my own will. And sadly, we often lose sight of his goodness and focus our attention uh, more and more and more on meeting our own needs. Well, I need this and I need this. And I need this. And there's things that you oftentimes may have to do because you have to take care of yourself. But often people go too far. They work two and three jobs so they can have all these different things. Sometimes somebody has to work several jobs. But this is when we begin to store up earthly possessions. When we 
try to gain as much as we can. So God's conditions for his care, and this will, we'll end it with this here in just a few moments. Jesus encourages his listeners not to be worried. Not to be worried about what to wear, what to eat, where they're going to have shelter. He says, listen, don't worry about those things. Instead, keep their focus on serving the Lord, that he would provide. Unfortunately, the Jews here had lost sight of God's provision. They were acting like he didn't exist, that they were only worrying about themselves, serving themselves, gaining what they could for themselves. Their lives and focus were laying up treasures on earth. And you often can see that in your own life or maybe your neighbors or people in your life that they're, they're constantly laying up treasures on earth. And since we can only serve one master at a time, God is the master who, who takes care of those that serve him. God will take care of you if you serve him, if you're obedient to him, if you're faithful to him. And so we should trust him alone and he will provide our needs. Not our wants, but our needs. As we look at uh, with, those, with our livelihood. And so when Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God in verse 31... He was encouraging them to look to the Lord to fulfill all the blessings promised to his children. And so Jesus rebuked his audience for not trusting the Lord while they pretended. They were planning. They were pretending this, this big plan and they were trying to plan ahead and they were trying to think of themselves of how they could get as much as they could get, as quickly as they could get it. And so they were storing up these earthly possessions and he rebuked his audience for not trusting him. And it was wrong to justify uh, postponing what, right, what was right. And they knew it was right. They knew that serving God was right. But they insisted they needed a plan of how to take care of themselves. How, how to look out for tomorrow. Where they were going to get their food for tomorrow. Where they were going to get their stuff for tomorrow. And the same idea can come into our mind when we're, we're constantly looking out for tomorrow, what, what we have to do today to get through to tomorrow instead of being faithful to the Lord. And if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, and in verse 16, he says this, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and pull up and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thou soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall uh, then who shall those things be, which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And so I read that story and think of this man was planning of how he was going to be happy and how he was going to be able to live his life and be okay. And the Bible says very clearly that we're not guaranteed tomorrow. And so instead of us planning on what we're going to have in retirement or what we're going to have tomorrow. Let's be faithful to the Lord today and realize and understand that we cannot serve two masters and that we have to focus on serving one and we need to serve the Lord with everything that we have. And so, like I said, with Pastor McInerney, he, he spoke on this, this topic Sunday morning and we cannot serve two masters. And so my question to you, uh, either here or online, is who do you want to serve? And, and where, do you, where do you place uh, all of your hope and your dreams? Is it on a job where you get that paycheck, where you think, man, I just got to keep going. I'm looking for the next promotion. I'm looking for the next big money uh, part in my life where I can have more money and more things. Because I've seen it happen in so many people's lives where they think, you know what? All I got to do is I have to get this promotion where I get more money and then I can serve more. But what happens is they get more money and they spend more money. And they think, well, 
Well, next time, okay, what I need is I need the next thing. I need the next promotion or I need the next job that's going to pay me more so I can serve. Same thing happens. They get the promotion. They work as hard as they can. They sacrifice time with their family. They sacrifice time with their, uh, with their church. And they get that next promotion, but yet they begin to serve themselves constantly. So will you serve yourself in the desire to have all that your heart desires, all that you want, all those wants in life? Are you, are you wanting to serve that? Hey, I want uh, this, this. You have a, a wish list where you say, I want this, this, I want this. Right? You may have a, a wish list on Amazon that's a mile long of all the things that you want. Right? I have that knowing that I'll never get those things, but it's always nice just to be like, oh, one, nope, never. But will you serve God knowing that he will provide all your needs? Understanding that we can serve only one master and uh, all of our time and effort has to be, can be, we can divide our time. We can try to serve two masters and we can try to serve the Lord and serve church and serve the world and serve, but we're not going to do either one of those well. And I would rather do something well. I would rather put all of my time and effort into doing something really, really well. And so that's my last little question, my challenge to you is who will you serve today? Will you serve man or will you serve God? Let's pray. Father God, we come to you. Lord, I'm so thankful for the ones that were able to come and Lord, the ones that watched online. Lord, and I pray that as we look at this study of serving two masters and realizing, Lord, that it's a very serious decision that we have to make and Lord, that we have to serve one. We have to make the choice. And Lord, your Bible says, the scripture says that we cannot be lukewarm. We have to choose one. We can either uh, be uh, cold or hot. And Lord, I, I pray that I'm hot, that I'm on fire for you. Lord, I pray that my craving for uh, material things, Lord, I, I hope that that never overshadows, Lord, that my craving for seeing people saved. Lord, my, my life never turns into me serving myself so I can have the next best thing or the next best electronic or tool. Lord, I pray that I can just, just be faithful to you and, and, Lord, serve you only. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to be with our church and, Lord, those that uh, may be dealing with some surgeries or recovery or even some sickness, I pray that you'll be with those. And, Lord, we uh, just pray for our country and we pray for our, our leaders and Lord, we pray for uh, our local and, and national leaders in this time. And Lord, we just pray that you'll uh, just continue to, to be with us. And Lord, uh, just be with our families and put a hedge of protection around them. And Lord, I pray that you also be with our military men and women. And Lord, thankful for them. And Lord, thankful for our veterans. And Lord, all that they have done. And Lord, I, I know that I will never be able to explain uh, or repay uh, what those men and women have done uh, for me and for my family. And uh, for the freedoms that I get to serve each and every day and, and be a part of. and So, Lord, I'm thankful for those, and I'm also thankful for those that each and every day that go to work uh, in the military to keep those freedoms alive, and I just pray that you'll keep them safe. And those that are uh, even overseas as of now, Lord, pray that you'll be with them. Lord, pray that you'll continue to be with our pastor, and, Lord, continue to give him wisdom and discernment on, uh, Lord, just next steps and, Lord, what we're supposed to do. And, Lord, I pray that you'll be with those at home, Lord, that are uh, just making those decisions as well. And Lord, many parents that are making decisions for school and uh, Lord, schools that are opening and some that all over the country that are beginning to close. And well, Lord, we just pray that you'll be with us and Lord, we pray that we can continue to serve you faithfully. We pray that we'll serve you and Lord, that we'll push everything aside and focus uh, our attention uh, and every and our time and effort on you. Lord, pray that you'll be with us now and Lord, again, be with the children's ministry. Bless them in their time together in these next few moments that they're together. And Lord, just give us a safe uh, drive home tonight and be with us. And Lord, bring us back on Sunday uh, for a great service and a great, great worship time. Lord, we love you and thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Michael. And thank you all for being with us tonight. And for those watching online, we appreciate your time and uh, excited to be back. Let me just share a couple quick things. Uh, as we consider Sunday coming, uh, we have partnered again with His Radio for the so Stockings for Soldiers campaign. And we're collecting uh, small items 
uh, snacks, beef jerky, card games, just little things that, uh, uh, that we could send over to the soldiers who are serving around the world, and we've done this several years now. And uh, we missed a couple Sundays because we were closed. So this Sunday coming up is our last opportunity to be a part of that. So if you're out and about the next few days and you're shopping somewhere and would like to pick up a few of those uh, snack items, you can get a list of the items on our website, I believe, um, or Facebook page. Go back a few days. You can probably find that listing of items. We may repost that, Brother Jody, if we could do that on our Facebook again to update people. So uh, we want to be a blessing to them. Some people have dropped off things throughout the week at the church office and even uh, tonight some folks brought some things in. So make sure you uh, participate if you can. Stockings for Soldiers this Sunday, November 15th is the uh, last opportunity uh, to participate this year so they can get that stuff out in plenty of time for them to receive it. Um, before Christmas. And then again, this Lord's Day, November 15th, we'll be back in session here on campus, and we invite you to join us 8 o'clock, 9.15, 10.30, and then 5 p.m. for our evening service, and Awana Ministry is back in session beginning this Sunday night as well. So God bless you. We'll be dismissed, and thank you so much for joining us tonight.